Well, good evening, Calvary Chapel Mountain View. I'm glad uh, you guys could tune in tonight um, and get excited. We're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 32. Um, but before we get into that, let's pray and go before the Lord. Lord, we thank you for tonight. I'm thankful, Lord, that uh, we're able to just dig into your word where you speak to us, where you show us, Lord, what to do. Lord, that uh, in you, Lord, we find peace. In you, we find hope, Lord. Thankful for this book um, that Jeremiah wrote, Lord. Praying, Lord, for all of us, Lord, as we seek after you, Lord, that you just instruct us and teach us, Lord. And also, Lord, we want to lift up all of those who are affected by the fires um, all throughout the Bay Area, Lord. We want to lift them up to you too, Lord, praying for them as they uh, some have to evacuate and others are making decisions on what to do. So, Lord, praying for them, praying for uh, their safety, Lord. And we lift them up in your name. Amen. All right. Well, like I said, we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 32. So uh, I'm glad you guys could all tune in. And, and get get into God's Word with me tonight. So if you've been following our Bible plan, we've flown through 28 chapters since last Wednesday. So we're flying through the Bible, through our Bible plan. And just to recap kind of what has been going on since then, well, if you remember back in Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah was called by God to preach a message of upcoming judgment. He wanted to tell all of Judah about what could happen if they didn't return to the Lord, if they didn't turn back to him. And this was really difficult for Jeremiah, right? Because this is not going to be a this wasn't a message that was probably going to be very well received, right? And Jeremiah is continuing in that. After the first chapter in Jeremiah 15. Uh, God is telling Jeremiah there that even if Moses and Samuel were there to pray for Israel, that they still would not be able to escape the judgment that would come to them if they didn't repent, right? And then Jeremiah 18, God, it, it likens God to the potter and Israel as the clay. And that's speaking of God's mercy and his desire to repair a marred, a broken up Israel and Judah as the clay. He wants to bring it back together. And in Jeremiah 20, uh, chapter 20, he's put in stocks. <laughs> he's made a laughing stock in Israel because of what he's saying and how unpopular he was. And we've covered a lot of territory since then, right? And, and here we are in Jeremiah chapter 29. And we're going to be covering the whole chapter, right? All 32 verses. And if you've read, if you've read Jeremiah 29 already, you kind of have a sense of what's going on, right? But if you haven't, um, Jeremiah 29 is a letter, a letter that God wanted Jeremiah to write to the Jewish uh, captives that are in Babylon, right? And writing letters is a lost art. It's not like that happens very often, right? Maybe we get birthday cards in the mail, bills, definitely bills, but... Receiving a letter seems like as ancient as the time as Jeremiah was living in. And in this chapter, we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about that letter that God so wanted Jeremiah to write. And let's get into the first three verses, which are like a background of, of the letter. So in verse 1 through 3. Here we go. So it says, Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem. To the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive, the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now this happened after Jeconiah the king, the queen mother, the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. Now in verse 3 it says, The letter was sent by the hand of Elat. Elasa, can't even say that name, <laughs> the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, we'll cut it right there. So those first three verses are giving us some context, some background info on the time 
uh, when the letter was written, right? So when you read this part, these first three verses, it was likely written after the letter um, had gone out, right? So that the book of Jeremiah, if you're reading the book of Jeremiah, you would understand the context behind the letter, right? Um, and understand who was it for? Why was it written? When was it written, right? They mention a lot of different historical figures here too as well and different characters. So we're going to try to explain who those are, right? Let's try to explore that and see who they are, right? So Nebuchadnezzar, he's mentioned, um, and he's the king of Babylon. And God used Babylon, used Nebuchadnezzar to conquer Israel, right? Conquer Judah. And we'll see him mentioned several times in the, in the Old Testament, actually, because he's one of those characters. He's in the book of Daniel, which will be in a few months or so, maybe even less. Um, at the rate we're going. Um, but Nebuchadnezzar was a prominent villain, right? He's, uh, God's, but God's using him to uh, capture Israel and Judah. He's famous for destroying Solomon's temple, but he's also famous for creating the hanging gardens in Babylon for his wife, which actually was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Fascinating, huh? And then next we see King Jeconiah. Well, who is that? I don't remember hearing about that guy. Well, he's also known as King Jehoiakim. And he was the last of the kings of Judah before Nebuchadnezzar took over. Now, what's interesting too, when you look at verse 3, it says, whom, Je whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon. So it seems like there's a contradiction here. How could there be two kings of Judah? Well, I'm about to explain that. <laughs> when Nebuchadnezzar took over, he appointed King Jeconiah or King Jehoiakim's uncle Zedekiah as the king of Judah. Like a figurehead, right? Because the real power was Nebuchadnezzar, not, not Zedekiah. And when Babylon took over, they first took the elders, as you see, they took the elders, they took the leadership, the prophets, took all of them over to assimilate them into Babylonian culture. And you also see that reference in the book of Daniel because Daniel is one of those uh, uh, individuals that got taken to be assimilated into Babylonian culture, right? And we'll be getting more into Daniel as uh, the next few months come along. Now, let's remember what Jeremiah was doing here. He's been warning Judah. He's been telling them, hey, hey, you know, return to the Lord. Stop backsliding. Stop going into sin. Stop worshiping idols. Stop doing all these pagan sacrifices, these pagan rituals. And God didn't just send just Jeremiah. He sent multiple prophets to warn Israel and Judah, right? But it all fell on deaf, deaf ears. And after King Josiah's death, the next four kings, they all refused to listen to Jeremiah. They put Jeremiah in stocks and disregarded everything he had said. And eventually, God's going to use Babylon, Babylon to take Judah captive, fulfilling Jeremiah's prophecies of judgment that God had given him. But as we've seen in this book and others before it, God has a plan for Israel and Judah. And now we're going to take a look at what God actually wants the Israelites to do while in captivity, but also what we can do when we're stuck in one of those difficult places, one of those less than ideal situations that we sometimes find ourselves in. So let's read these next four verses. So from four to nine, uh, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Verse five says, build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit." Take wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And then verse seven, and seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, you will have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you. 
nor listen to your dreams, which you have caused, which you caused to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. Wow. God has a lot to say to the Jewish exiles, right? He's basically saying, prepare yourself. You're going to be here for a long time. 70 years to be exact. And he's implying, and that's what he's implying when he's telling Israel to build and to plant, right? He's implying, you're going to be here for a while, so you might want to make get comfortable, right? <laughs> And then he explains that they should marry and have kids. They should build roots, right? So that they don't diminish. So that Israel doesn't disappear and doesn't uh, meld within the melting pot of Babylon. Because Babylon culture was, it was uh, everyone was there. There was all kinds of different cultures there. And the goal of the Babylons, Babylonians was to assimilate you into their culture. So to adopt them in there so you could adopt Babylonian culture and, and become a, Bab a Babylonian versus your original culture, right? <clears throat> now, God also tells them to seek peace where, where they have been caused to go by the Lord, even praying for peace while you're in the city, if that doesn't make them <laughs> more upset. <laughs> well, let's think about this. Have you ever found yourself in a situation like this? You're at work, maybe you're at school, and you don't want to be there. But there you are. I think God is saying something to us here. That wherever we are as Christians, we should wait on the Lord, right? And we should prepare to stay longer than we want to in that place. That place of difficulty or maybe that place where we're just like not about it, right? We want to move on. Lord, Lord, take me out of here. I don't want to be here anymore. Because I'm sure these, these Jews were saying the same thing. They were like, yeah, we've been here for 10 minutes. Let's move on. You know, let's go back to Jerusalem. We get it, God. I'm going to do better. I'm, I'm ready to go back, you know, but God's saying, no, you're going to be here for a while, right? And sometimes that happens to us too. We may be praying to Lord, take me out, but God has left you there for a reason, just like he's leaving the Israelites, the Jews here in Babylon for a reason. And this kind of reminds me of way back in the day, I was an after school program leader and I had been there for years and I mostly enjoyed it. I had a great time, but my last year was really hard. Um, that last year was, was very difficult. And at times throughout that year, I'd thought of quitting, but I stuck it out because, well, you know, I felt like God still had something for me to do. I didn't want to leave right away. You know, I had that, that feeling where like, I want to leave, but gosh, I feel like there's something I have to do, you know, that God wants me to do. And it was towards the end of the school year and we threw a party for the kids, for all of our uh, elementary school kids that, you know, we had been watching just a kind of celebration end of the year kind of thing. Um, my group had a really tough year. And if you had to pick a group of kids that didn't deserve a party, it was going to be my group for sure. <laughs> they were very difficult, <laughs> um, but it was probably my group, but God used, God used it for good, right? And God spoke to me about what grace is, that grace is the unmerited favor of God, right? We don't deserve it, but he gives it to us anyways, because he loves us. So I felt like the Lord was leading me to share, and I did. Every one of my kids, I gave them a gift, which was probably some candy and maybe a little toy, but... And they were shocked because they knew that they didn't deserve it. Um, but each one of them, I told them, I'm giving this to you because of grace. And they're like, what's grace? And I explained that grace was the unmerited favor of God, that God loves us so much that he gives us, he, he doesn't give us what, he, what we deserve, right? And I said that you guys have been difficult, but I want to show you some grace. I want to show you that I do love you guys and that, God loves you, right? And I shared that with those kids, and I don't know what's happened to them since then, um, but I knew that that was what God had wanted me to do. And by the way, my coworkers were really shocked I had done this because I did this in public. I wasn't, you know, hiding away or anything like that. My coworkers were like, what are you doing? And I pretty much just told them, grace, that is what I'm doing. And they were shocked. 
they were shocked probably for a while. And I want to just, yeah, reassure you guys that God has a plan for where you are. And it may be difficult to see right now because it's, you know, maybe you got some difficult coworkers. You, you're just not uh, feeling the work uh, or just, you know, maybe you've been there a long time and you maybe want to move on and do something else. But remember this, God has a plan for where you are. There's a reason why you're there. So be encouraged in that. Now, when we're reading this, these last few verses, God was talking about building houses and planting gardens. Well, when you're in that place um, and you're kind of struggling with where you are and why you're there, seek to build. Build relationships. Let the Holy Spirit move through you and affect your, affect your workplace, affect your school, wherever you are for Jesus. Plant, plant the seed of the gospel. There's a purpose for where you're at. God wants each of us to spread the good news of Christ wherever we're at. And anytime, right? Those uh, holy appointments. Think about that. Get that in your mind. And also remember, God wants us to seek. He wants us to seek after the peace, after peace, wherever you're at. And who better to help us Understand peace than the Prince of Peace, Jesus. Seek after Jesus and you will find peace. Now, just like the Israelites, though, we can listen to people telling us that we should leave or that we won't be there a long time. Just like those those false prophets were. God saying, don't listen to them. Don't listen to those diviners. Don't listen to the dreams that you're causing yourself to dream. These guys were not sent by me. They're telling you the wrong information. They're leading you astray, basically. Now, God deal, directly deals with those kinds of people. God's saying, yeah, they, I have not sent them at all. Don't even listen to them. They're deceptive. They're deceiving you. Keep that in mind, too, because there's going to be people like that. When you know that God has you somewhere, he has you there. But there's going to be some people that are going to want to distract you from that. Just like Jeremiah's call to be a prophet, he could have given up the first sign of trouble. But he knew the Lord and he knew what the Lord had told him, that he would be with him. And God is with you, wherever you're at. Now we're going to get in these next four verses and we're going to see how God is encourages his people with his heart for them and for us. So verses 10 through 14, here we go. So it says, For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. After the 70 years of judgment, God's saying he's going to honor that promise to bring them back from exile into Israel, back to Jerusalem. Because you see, the exile was all part of God's plan to give them a future and a hope. See, this judgment would prompt the exiles, the Jews, to seek after God wholeheartedly. Once they had turned back from their sin into God, he would bring them back to the place from which he caused them to be carried away captive. Maybe you're asking yourself, well, Chris, uh, I know these verses, but 
What does that have to do with me? I'm not a Jew. Like, I'm not way back in Jeremiah's time. I'm here in the 21st century. Well, as Christians, we can backslide. We can fall back into sin. We can mess up and feel all that shame and guilt, just like the Israelites. No doubt they're erect, totally shocked, and, and that this was even happening. Some of them are probably even ashamed. But God is saying, this fall, this exile, was for your good. And it's for them to realize that the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you future and a hope. This was for their good. See, decades and decades of sin, decades and decades of disobedience had hardened their hearts. They weren't receptive to God's word. So God, who's righteous and holy, had to judge them, had to give them consequences for their actions. But isn't that encouraging that even though that, that God is... Even though God is telling the Israelites that even though you've been in sin for decades, if you would just seek after me, you will find me. And I will bring you back from your captivity. And we can all be in captivity, right? We can all be in some sort of chains. They can be addiction. They can be past hurts, hangups, all kinds of things. But whatever chains we have, God can release us from them. And it kind of reminds me of this song by Zach Williams called Chain Breaker. And it goes like this. If you've got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you've got chains, he's a chain breaker. So be encouraged. If you're in chains, if you're in captivity, just like these Israelites, God can release you from that. Seek after him. And he will bring you back to who you are, not what you used to be. Well, let's, we're going to get in the next few verses and get ready to be surprised. Because there's a little bit of a shift in these next few verses. We're going to dive in and see what God has to say to these false prophets who ignored Jer Jeremiah's words. So, verses 15 through 20. Get ready. Here we go. Verse 15, because you have said the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon. 16 says, therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king who sits on the throne of David, concerning all the people who dwell in this city and concerning your brethren who have not gone out with you into ca captivity. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send on them the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, and will make them like rotten figs that cannot be eaten. They are so bad. <laughs> Love that. And I will pursue them with the sword, with famine, and with pestilence, and I will deliver them to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth to be a curse, an astonishment, a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them. Because they have not heeded my words, says the Lord. Underline that. Which I sent to them by my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them. Neither would you heed, says the Lord. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, all you of the captivity, whom I have sent from Jerusalem to Babylon. So these prophets mentioned here are the very false prophets God had referenced to in verse 8. And these are the people that believed them too. Because these Jews were still in Jerusalem. They thought they had escaped God's judgment. They thought, man, sorry for you guys, but I'm going to live it up over here. You know, like they were so hot, you know, they could just handle it. Oh, we're good. No, man, we got it. We made it. We survived. And God is saying, whoa, hold on, man. Um, I'm not sparing any judgment for you guys that are in Jerusalem. Be advised. <laughs> God is still going to make sure that they experience the consequences of their sin too. He mentions war, famine, pestilence, which is disease. 
that they would all come their way. And he mentions that his prophets, which he had sent, they, those guys, those people didn't heed the words of the prophets, just like those who had been taken to Babylon. And this is a reality check for the Israelites, but for us too, right? There are definite consequences for our actions. So here we are in verses 24 through 28. Um, and here we're going, we're going to get, get started. You shall also speak to Shemaiah the Nehalamite, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, You have sent letters in your name to all the people who are at Jerusalem, to Zephaniah the son of Messiah the priest, and to all the priests, saying, The Lord has made you priest instead of Jehoiada the priest, so that there, were, there should be officers in the house of the Lord over every man who is demented and considers himself a prophet that you should put him in prison and in the stocks. Now, therefore, why have you not rebuked Jer Jeremiah of Anathoth who makes himself a prophet to you? For he has sent to us in Babylon saying, this captivity is long, build houses and dwell in them and plant gardens and eat their fruit. <laughs> when you're following God and seeking him, it's often that we'll get some criticism. And just like Jeremiah here, Jeremiah is receiving some hate mail from this false prophet, Shemaiah, who sent letters to the high priest, uh, to one of the priests, Zephaniah. So just to kind of recap this verse, because there's a lot going on here. Um, this second message was to Shemaiah, the Nah Nahilamite, and he had sent letters to Zephaniah, who's a priest, the high priest. And he's telling him to stop and punish every man who's demented and considers himself a prophet. And he's really meaning Jeremiah here and perhaps some other people too. But he's focusing on Jeremiah because sometimes when you do good for the Lord, it just makes people mad. Remember that story I told you earlier about when I worked at the school and talked to my kids about grace? Some of my coworkers were actually really mad at me for saying that and doing what I did. Just like Shemaiah here. He can't stand that Jeremiah is doing anything for the Lord, that he even says, calls himself a prophet. He's jealous, right? And then it says, why have you not rebuked Jeremiah of Anathoth? Shemaiah wanted Zephaniah, the priest, to do everything he could to oppose and discredit Jeremiah, denying his message that they would be in exile for a long time and should make the best of it. Well, we must keep this in mind, though, we may have those kind of people in our lives. We, we should always pray for them because God can change people's hearts, right? Just look at what God says earlier in the chapter to Judah and Israel. If you seek me, you'll find me. But God is also faithful to his word. What he said he would do, he will do. Shemaiah was guilty of sin just like everyone else, but he is clearly not repentant. And next we're going to see what God thinks about that. So in verses 29 through 32, closing out the, the chapter. So in verse 29, now it says, Now Zephaniah the priest read this letter in the hearing of Jeremiah the prophet. So he's helping out Jeremiah. He's like, hey, I found this letter. <laughs> and then in verse 30, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Send to all those in captivity, saying, Thus says the Lord concerning Shemaiah the Nehemite, because Shemaiah has prophesied to you, and I have not sent him, and he has caused you to trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will punish Shemaiah the Nehelamite and his family. He shall not have anyone to dwell among this people, nor shall he see the good that I will do for my people, says the Lord, because he has taught rebellion against the Lord. All right, so there's a lot going on here. So we're going to make sure you're tracking with me here. We're going to, I'm going to go through each and every little part of this. So here we go. So it feels like a Facebook post with like thousands and thousands of comments. And you're trying to figure out like where this all began. So this is what it's going to be like. That first letter, verses uh, 1 through 23, um, in Jeremiah 29 was what Jeremiah wrote to the Jews in Babylon, right? Then Shemaiah, this false prophet comes in the picture and he writes a letter, which is verses 25 through 28. 
to the leaders in Jerusalem condemning what Jeremiah had been saying and prophesying. And then next in verse 29, and then Shemaiah's letter was read to Jeremiah by Nehemiah, that priest that Shemaiah had been trying to like manipulate to be against Jeremiah. And verses 30 through 32 are, is basically Jeremiah delivering God's word of judgment to Shemaiah. It says, Behold, I will punish Shemaiah. God directed Jeremiah to respond with a prophetic declaration against Shemaiah. God was going to punish this false prophet and his family. They would die out with no descendants and never see the good that God would do for his people. And it may seem harsh, but God, these guys were speaking falsely in God's name. They were bearing false witness, right? They were declaring what they thought God was telling them, right? But it wasn't the Lord. God had not sent them, right? So God, who is holy and righteous, was going to judge them also, very specifically. Now, something to remember in closing. One, one reason to keep faithful to God through the difficulties of life is simply so we can be around when God does remarkable good for his people. Shemaiah, Ahab, and Zedekiah were not faithful, and they stand in contrast to Jeremiah, who honored God and was faithful to his call. And remember what God says, you know, that there's, there's going to be good. And that's what Shemaiah and Ahab and Zedekiah are going to miss out because they weren't faithful to the Lord. In contrast to Jeremiah, who most definitely was. But as we all know, life can be difficult, can be hard. It can be hard to be in a job or be at a school or be in a certain situation which you're not a big fan of, right? It's, it's really hard on you. It's testing you, right? But God knows. And I encourage you to stay faithful to the Lord. He knows what you're dealing with, and he's with you, just like he's with Jeremiah. Trust him. Now, in closing, we're going to go back to that verse, Jeremiah 20, 11, 29, 11, that everyone knows. Uh, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So be encouraged, Calvary Chapel, Mountain View, wherever you are, God is with you. And there is a future and a hope for you if you seek him wholeheartedly with your entire being. God is going to be with you and blessing you. So thank you guys for listening tonight. We're going to have one more song. And let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for your word. That you, that it is truth, Lord. And that you want to speak to us and show us, Lord, that you have a future and a hope that you have good planned for us. Lord, and all you ask is that we seek you, seeking after you, Lord, and that you'll bring us back, you'll bring us out of that captivity, out of those chains, and into your loving arms. So, Lord, praying for everyone now, uh, tonight, praying for the church and everyone listening and watching, and praying for uh, everyone that's dealing with the fires, as we prayed earlier. Lord, just praying for your uh, touch on them, Lord, and that uh, your care for them, Lord. Praying for your grace to be showered on them as well. Lord, so thank you for tonight and pray that uh, we all have a good night. In your name, amen.